Again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Stan Van Hoff. I'm the Business Development Manager at Exclusive Networks. Um, and today we're going to talk about ransomware. Well, at least I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about it. It will be Bert van Oudsgaarde, who is a Senior uh, Incident Response Consultant at Mendiant. Um, so uh, stay tuned for, for that part. Um, I'm just quickly going to give you some information about one of the, the products that um, actually supports FireEye Mendiant in, in the entire process. And that is uh, main security validation. Um, so again, I, I'm responsible for FireEye as a business development manager, and I have a great focus actually on security validation. Why? Because I think it's one of the coolest products I've seen in the last years. And um, I think today is about knowledge sharing and actually sharing that information that can help protect your environment against uh, specific attacks like a ransomware attack. Um, but I wouldn't be a good sales if I don't take the opportunity now to actually explain a quick word about security validation and more specifically, and like this topic about ransomware and the ransomware assessment. Um, so managed security validation is actually an automated tool that you can, you can use to actually continuously validate and monitor the effectiveness of your security stack. Um, and you can actually validate that against the latest and advanced threats uh, and every known threat actor that, that FireEye knows, and those, and they know a lot. I mean, it's not just a normal breach and attack simulation, but it goes way further than that because we also we have the best threat intel, and based on that intel, we can safely execute real life attacks. I mean, against your entire security stack, we can test your firewall, your EDR tool, uh, your proxy. Uh, and not only test it, but also optimize your environment because you have made a lot of investments in all those different security features. But we have to make sure that you're, they're performing like they should be. Um, I mean, a uh, small fun fact, only 9% of all the events on your seam are actually correlated. I mean, you invest a lot of money and time in all these um, security products. And actually we, we, we assume that they are functioning fine, but we don't know that. I mean, that's why we have security validation, not just like the, the snapshot of one moment is my 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 security stack safe, like with a pen test, but continuously we monitor it all the time to see any environmental changes and drifts. Uh, and drifts. So it's a really cool, uh, cool product we have to actually assess your entire security stack. Um, but we can do not only the, the entire security stack, but also more specific uh, specific assessment. In this case, we, we, we can also do a ransomware assessment. Uh, what we can do is we just use a piece of the, of, the, of the features we can do with security validation and specifically target your endpoints, your EDR solution, your network components to see if we try to launch one of the latest um, advanced threats containing um, a ransomware, how does your security stack perform on that part? And then you get a comprehensive report. And I mean, it's completely automated, so it's very easy to set up, but it gives you a, a better view and to know how, yeah, how safe are you against these type of attacks. So if you're interested in doing that, please contact me. Uh, my info is in the slides. Um, I'm also gonna send out the slides after this session. So please do contact us. So, okay, that was my part and, and the sales part. Now it's only information sharing. So um, I'm proud to announce today that um, Bart van Oudgaarde is taking uh, his time to actually um, teach us about how to actually handle these types of, of attacks. I mean, they're devastating attacks. We can see them in the media almost every day. Um, so without further ado, I'm, uh, I'm gonna pre make Bart presenter and then he can he can talk um, more about this type of attacks. All right, hi. Thanks everybody for joining in uh, today's session. I'll just turn on my webcam so that you can know you, who you have in, uh, in, front of, uh, in front of you. And I'll talk about today uh, on, these, uh, yeah, on these incidents, right? How, how do they work? How do the guys behind these attacks work? And, and, and how do we investigate them? Perfect. All right, so I'll turn off my webcam so you're not too distracted and you just can focus on the slides, right? All right, so thanks, Dan, for that uh, introduction. So, yeah, just a few words about myself. Um, working here in the region um, near Brussels, um, so my daily job involves 
investigating incidents, right? That that's what I do for a living. So obviously there's like a lot of digital forensics involved because we try to establish uh, facts. And uh, I've been doing that for for a while. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity since um, yeah more than two de decades now. And so yeah, part of Mandiant. Um, in case you haven't heard about Mandiant yet, uh, we're part of the uh, FireEye family. We do more than 1,000 um, investigations, engagements, we call them, uh, per year. And uh, yeah, we have a quite a global team that we're working with, um, and we have expertise on, on handling these kind of complex and, and, and difficult cases. Um, we also have a very large uh, threat intel team, uh, and they investigate these uh, actors, uh, how they, they behave. We have more than 300 of those uh, globally. They speak different languages. They're also involved in dark web conversations with these uh, actors uh, to try to understand how they operate so that we can better protect them against those kind of threats. But my focus is specifically on incident response. The customer calls us up, we have an issue, we investigate, we help them through that incident and try to uncover what access uh, that the attackers had into the environment, how did they get in, what data did they get, and how, of course, do we restore the business? Of course, <laughs> I'm going to talk about those incidents, right? So, uh, but yeah, you do understand. I um, we wouldn't have the trust from our customers if we if we would disclose all of the um, their details uh, in a webinar like this. So, kind of traditional uh, disclaimer: nothing that I'm saying over here is going to be specific to one or the other victim um, or company that has engaged with us. Um, so let's start off with something funny, right? Who are these guys? <laughs> and um, well, obviously, these are some of the ransomware um, operators. Uh, in this case, it's pictures taken on a parking lot in, um, in Moscow, um, where they're driving around with fancy cars. I have to say that they have a bad taste for, for cars, right? Um, but um, yeah, there are people behind these attacks. Eh? It is not a virus. It is people that have little emotions and are only focused on money. And I think maybe one of the nicer details is if you look into the license plates of these cars, um, they resemble the letters B, OP and um, BOP actually means in Russian it's kind of slang for thief, right? Um, so that is how overtly they are. That is how untouchable they feel. And they make lots of money and drive around with fancy cars, uh, making money of, of victims. But let's like, dive deeper into that. How do they operate? And that is what I will talk about today, based upon the investigations that we do. Ransomware comes in a different different varieties, right? So you you're obviously aware about self-propagating um, uh, ransomware, uh, self-propagating um, malware that propagates and it basically spreads around. Um, in the worst cases, like NotPetya or WannaCry, to an uncontrollable amount of uh, victims. But we're actually going to focus on the right hand side which is the manual detonation where there's basically a team behind it there's a group of people that are focused to get into your organization and even there you can kind of make two different um, groups of people uh, two groups of ransomware operators on the one hand you have the kind of spray and pray <laughs> um, ransomware operators like Zeus and, and, and other um, uh, actors, and then make, make malware to try to email it to as many victims as possible, and they hope to land on a system that is valuable. Uh, and then they obviously encrypt. But also they are, they have, they are successful because they spread around their ransomware, ransomware to a lot of victims as much as possible. But what we're going to focus on today is much more the targeted deployment. The ransomware operators that focus on larger organizations or small to medium organizations, but they focus 
on that organization and that deliberately target an organization because they know they can get money out of that organization, right? And that I'm going to talk about, and we're going to see two different models of how these ransomware operators work. On one hand, you have the partnership models, right? You can look at it two different group of people or that actually work together, right? You have people perhaps focusing on developing the ransomware itself, the actual software that's going to encrypt data. And then there's going to be the group of people that actually get into a network and allow access to that network. More recently, we've also seen ransomware as a service where there's a ring leader and there's that different affiliates that have to buy in to the ransomware as a service model. We're going to talk about that. We're going to start off with one of those groups. So before we can get started to talk about ransomware operators, how do they work? How do they deploy? I'm going to speak about APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. Many of you are already aware what is an APT. But what makes an APT successful in a network is that typically they go for domain admin access into your environment. Having domain admin access in your environment in an Active Directory domain gives them the ability to search computers for the data that they want. And they likely have one or multiple persistence mechanisms. Persistence at system level, so that once you reboot, you have, again, the uh, backdoor running but also different systems and different mechanisms in, in your environment. They're not going to deploy one type of backdoor, but they perhaps also have compromised your VPN, and they maybe also have compromised your public facing web server by deploying a web shell on that. And an advanced persistent threat actor will likely go after data that can be found within your network that is of value for them. And then we're speaking obviously about espionage threat actors. Now let's take a look at those targeted ransomware threat actors. What is the difference between an APT actor? Actually, not that much. A targeted ransomware operator will also have all of the above, but in addition, they will make sure that you, they bring down your business. A APT actor wants to be in your network as long as possible. And we see them being stealthy for many months if if they can for many years. Whereas a ransomware operator will bring down your business. They will make sure that at a certain moment of encryption that you are aware because that will increase their chances of payout. And we'll look into much closer how they actually work uh, with all the steps that we have uh, investigated. So let's take a look at one of those uh, ransomware operators. This is a ransomware uh, group, I would say, but more specifically, it's a ransomware as a service. Uh, and this group is called ReEvil, um, or also known by its malware that it's been using, so the Nokia Beam. So ransomware as a service. Specifically, ReEvil, we have seen them since 2019. And so basically, the, the ring leader of, of this group, of this ransomware as a service, as a service model, is operated by a persona, maybe one or multiple persons, under the handle of UNKN or unknown. And unknown is the ring leader that basically decides who has access to this, uh, to this model. So he selects his kind of customers. And so they roll into that uh, ransomware as a service. Um, they have to be vetted, meaning they have to be um, selected by unknown. And they, put more, they have to put money on the table, right? You cannot be an affiliate of the ransomware uh, as a service unless you actually buy in to that, uh, to that service. And of course, unknown is in there also for the money, he makes his money by, an, um, by getting a, a percentage of that uh, ransom uh, so that the affiliates do the hard work, but he's basically 
the person that manages this ransomware as a service. And we'll, we'll take a look at why the affiliates basically buy into that ransomware as a service and what do they get in exchange for um, in exchange for that money that they will lose to uh, to unknown. But it's also a model where unknown will review how well performing each of these uh, affiliates are. And if they're not performing well, they're basically kicked out of the um, ransomware as a service uh, ring. And so they will no longer be having access to the um, service that they will be getting from, uh, from unknown. So why do the affiliates, so basically the people that are doing the hard work that are performing these intrusions, why do they buy into that? Before we do, do look into that, uh, I've also um, shown on this slide of like who are the victims, right? Of this, um, of this uh, ransomware itself. And so the answer is, yeah, basically almost everybody. And certainly, and this is a slide from 2020, a high impact to healthcare services, right? And that, of course, shows how little uh, value these people have for, uh, for human life. So why would these affiliates basically buy into that uh, ransomware as a service? And what do they get in exchange for that? They get in exchange malware, uh, but not just any malware, not any um, encryptor, no, they get a piece of software that they know is unique for each of their victims. And so when they buy into that service, they have the ability to generate malware that has a unique decryption key and that has that they have the assurance is not detected um, by the latest uh, antivirus signatures. And so they, of course, make changes to that malware every time so that it becomes more har harder to detect. And also, um, a unique decryption key. Um, otherwise, one victim would share their decryption key and then basically you would be able to decrypt all of the data. So that is what they get. Also, unknown manages the demand and payout payment service. Right, So he manages the last step where they actually get money out of the victim. And so they, they do the negotiations with the victim, they do the communication. Obviously, this person is a familiar or this business function, I would say, is familiar with um, with English, with many languages, and they are able to work on the psychology of the victim itself. And they also do uh, Bitcoin or uh, Monero laundering, right? So they also provide a sort of a, a, a cryptocurrency anonymization service where it's more difficult to track where the money, in fact, is uh, is going to. And so obviously unknown has positioned him or herself at that last stage where there's actually payout so that he or she can control uh, and also make sure that they get their percentage on the on the payout so that is the reason why these uh, affiliates buy into that uh, into that model of course they need to share a piece of the pie right but in the end they get um, quite, quite a lot of um, uh, good value for money for them. So what is so specific about uh, SOTD Nokibi, the ransomware itself? And we'll, we'll take a look at how this differs from other um, ransomware um, models. With this specific ransomware, the systems that are affected, so when there's actual encryption taking place, they remain functional, meaning that the data on the system is encrypted, but they, your Windows systems will still keep on running, right? So it's not like your computers are no longer bootable. No, you can still run your computer system itself, but just all of your documents are encrypted. And yeah, certainly with kind of more spray and pray um, ransomware or where there's um, large ransomware deployments, there have been in the past some weaknesses in the crypto. So that would allow a victim to decrypt the data without support of the uh, ransom operator. And of course, yeah, they want to avoid it at uh, all costs as possible, but of course that will decrease their chances of, uh, of a payout. So when they do crypto, they do it properly. 
Um, and so they also create a unique key for each of the system affected and only in exchange of that key um, back to the ransomware operator, they'll give you a decryption key that you can then use to decrypt your data. And there's no way around that. You need their help in order to uh, decrypt your data. Um, and that's another, let's say, more high level perspective that I'll share with you is how long does it take before you're actually um, see the ransomware being deployed in your environment. So from the moment that the attacker is actually has access to your network until the time that they deploy the ransomware, so the so the PB uh, ransomware in your environment, that really depends on on each of the affiliates, right? So you have unknown at the top, he has his all of his affiliates, and then each of these affiliates have a number of victims assigned. And then, so basically, they, they work on the backlog of vic victims, right? So it can sometimes take a few days, but sometimes can take multiple months before the um, ransomware operators. They may initially perform the intrusion, but it may take them a month or two before they actually start encrypting all of your, uh, of your data, because they're still working on the backlog of uh, victims that they're still um, um yeah getting access to all right so these are kind of the highlights at, um, of how this model works ransomware as a service so now let's get a little bit more technical on how this actually function and we'll do that based upon what we call the attack life cycle model which is something that uh, we as manians use to explain these attacks to our our customers so we'll dive into each of these phases of the attacks themselves. So first of all, at the initial compromise phase, the objective of the attacker is to make sure that they have one way or the other access to your environment. And that really doesn't matter for them. How do, do they achieve that, right? So they will use whatever method possible. And we've seen them using, for example, remote access systems, which you're obviously all using right now to get access uh, and to perform teleworking. They'll use yeah, SharePoint vulnerabilities, uh, which we've seen a few of them the uh, last couple of years. Also expose remote desktop services. Quite recently also, many default passwords were shared of uh, remote desktop services. Certainly, if these are exposed on the internet, like any any diff, any way that they can get into your environment, and certainly, I mean, either they can use stolen credentials, or there have been a number of high-profile um, vulnerabilities in many of the products uh, externally hosted. Yeah. As an example, the latest uh, series of Exchange uh, vulnerabilities also can be used by. Uh, ransomware operators to get that initial compromise, right? But obviously they don't want to target that exchange server. They want to get a foothold within your environment. Um, another technique we have seen is lateral movement through third parties, right? Your network may be exposed to other entities. And if they're compromised in one or the other way, they may find a way into your network. So it definitely doesn't limit it to uh, one victim. Credential stuffing and phishing, these are the more traditional stuff, right, where they collect a, a large number of um, credentials, which are then exposed, which they can obviously reuse against any externally hosted uh, services where this password will work. And then kind of the more traditional phishing me mechanisms, send an email, either the email contains an attachment or leads to a link on a, on a website. Again, it doesn't matter how do they get in, they will use a variety of techniques once they have a focus on your organization. This is just one of the examples. Um, once they have access to your environment, they want to maintain a foothold, right? They want to be able to exchange information back and forward between your environment. You can, they can start deploying a backdoor um, like Cobalt Strike, they can misuse your VPN service 
to get data in and out of your network. Or they can also, in this example shown on the slide over here, they can use a web shell, right? A web page that has been modified in order for them to allow to upload files, to download files, and to execute comments. And that is very much of how other APT actors operate. If you have a APT actor, an espionage threat actor, they also behave in the very same way. They use the same techniques. So looking at the different stages of re-evil, and again, when we speak about re-evil, we speak about not just one group, but multiple affiliates under that ransomware as a service. They kind of use these different techniques at each different stage of, uh, of the life cycle. And we've already spoken about the initial compromise, the established foothold. And then once they're within the network itself, as I've explained before, they want to go for domain admin credentials. And because domain admin credentials are going to give them access to every computer in the Windows network. And so once they're in that network, once they have established that foothold, they will want to search and obtain those credentials. And the way they do that is they either search for those credentials on domain shares, or they use or they dump um, ALSA's process memory, or they execute mimic ads in your environment so that they can um, escalate those privileges. And then furthermore, they need to kind of get an understanding of what the networks look like, what are the computer names, what are the domain controller controllers in that environment. So they will need to do some, what we call internal reconnaissance, and they will need to do some network scanning where they basically need to learn your environment. When we investigate, when I investigate an attacker, it's very common that the attacker in the initial phase doesn't really know how, how the networks look like. And you kind of almost can see that based upon the comments they execute. And people think about, hey, I have an hacker in my network, they must have all the wisdom. And, and obviously that's not the case. They need to learn your network. Um, they need to find out what are the computers that are important. What is the systems that are really important to your to your business? What are the domain controllers? And that is happening during that internal reconnaissance phase. And then once they have an understanding of how your network um, is um, organized, they will move laterally. And so obviously the system that they may have gotten access to initially, now if they got an initial access on that exchange server that you have exposed, or if they got access to a web server or a VPN device, that may not be the system that they actually want to target. In the case of a ransomware, they want to target every computer in the network. So they need to move laterally, they need to get access to other systems in the network itself that may be in the same domain or in a, in another domain that you trust. And again, they want to avoid after all of this hard work that in case you find them somehow that they're being kicked out of your network. And so they will use multiple ways to maintain persistence. Um, maintaining persistence allows them so even if they have, you have discovered that initial COBOL strike that you saw that we've mentioned earlier as one of the possible backdoors that they can use, even if you have discovered that, that they still have multiple ways of getting back into your network. And they don't want to lose their access after they've done all of the, the hard work. And then certainly also for some of the ransomware operators, for some of the ransomware affiliates, they will also conduct data theft. A data theft, and I have a specific example about that. Data theft is going to ensure that they can also, in addition to encrypt your data, going to steal data so that they can put additional pressure on the victim. And they have the possibility to expose that data um, or they can also sell that data. We'll speak about that later. But eventually they want to complete their mission. And they're, they're in your network for a reason, and the reason is money. So at a certain moment, they want to complete that mission, and they're going to encrypt all of the data in your network. And we'll look at examples. How do, do they exactly do that? A little more about data theft. We've seen, again, 
very traditional techniques being used by some of the ransomware um, operators. Traditional methods used by APT style actors are like compressing files using searching for file extensions and then putting them in RAR files or zip files. But also ransomware, specifically some of the re evil um, operators are using like mega.nz or pcloud uh, cloud services, likely because they have a good transfer rate. Um, but they place a um, synchronization tool on uh, your workstations or servers, whatever. I think they they assess the whole value for them. And they basically ensure that everything that on that system, on that server is being uploaded to these um, external services. So they do that obviously before they deploy the ransomware, right? So that they can make sure that they have access to that data um, before they actually start encrypting it. And I think the other things we have seen with the um, with the ransomware affiliates uh, forum ReEvil is that they also focus on disabling antivirus first, right? So obviously that's a risk for them. If you have antivirus in your organization, um, the ransomware deployment, once it actually starts encrypting, um, reduces the possibility that that actually will run. It will also increase the possibility that you will detect it. Um, so they may not be su so successful. So we've seen re-evil operators starting to disable uh, antivirus first, right? So in this example, they created a script, um, in this case, to disable assets, but again, it could be any type of antivirus that they have. They execute it with domain admin administrative privileges first. So that is also something to be on the lookout for, right? If your antivirus starts stopping, and if you see these kind of scripts being deployed, again, they make it seemingly like a legitimate antivirus uh, script, or seemingly like a legitimate script that would be run by an attacker. But this is in fact something that was triggered by the uh, ransomware operator. The way that they execute it can either be using a GPO script, or we've also seen, in effect, often abused, also using SCCM, right? So your systems configuration management, your system management that you would use to deploy any software in your environment. If the attackers are able to get hold of that system, they can also deploy it, these kind of scripts, but we also see that they can also use that to deploy any ransomware and, uh, encryptors as well. And eventually, they want to start encrypting data, right? So that is really at the last stage, but that, that is at the moment that they will start making noise. And so um, before they do that, they want to make sure that you're unable to recover um, as much as possible. And so again, another sign could be deletion of file backups, removal of any um, compressed files or deletion of um, virtual machine snapshots. Again, all for the sake of making sure that you're not in a good shape to start those uh, negotiations with them. Uh, the, the more they have assurance that you're not able to recover, the less, um, the, 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 the more likely they are, you are to actually uh, pay them out and make a decision to actually um, pay the ransomware demanded. And eventually, they will deploy and uh, deploy their uh, encryptor in your environment. And so the way they do that is also how many of the software deployments are working. Um, they open up a, a file share in your environment, typically hosted on one of the domain controllers that actually hosts uh, one of the um, encryptors in the environment. So they make that share available to all of your computers in your system. A domain controller is ideal for that because it needs to be accessible to all of your computers. They either work with a GPO script, group policy uh, object that will then create a scheduled task. And then at a specific interval, it will um, go and fetch it executable and then execute it on the local system. And then it will start encrypting that. Uh, they may not always be successful uh, with this technique. Uh, so then sometimes they're also using PS exec, which is a remote executable um, program to execute any 
um, the ransomware on the systems, they may have been unable to uh, deploy the ransomware onto and to really make sure that they have a large as possible impact into the environment itself. And eventually you will find out and you will find out because your data is encrypted, uh, but also you have this text file on your system basically telling you, hey, this is what's going on. We'll make a business proposal to you. No hard feelings, but you will need to pay us money, right? And obviously that will lead you to a um, cryptocurrency uh, site where you will, um, you can start uh, doing the payout uh, itself. I have a slide specifically about those payouts and how the, these are chosen. So that is one group that I wanted to highlight. Again, we'll look at another group which works in a kind of a different model. Uh, we've spoken about ransomware as a service and Reevil is an example of uh, those. Different group, different modus operandi. I mean, we've known QuakeBot um, traditionally as a kind of a banking Trojan, but it also work hand in hand more recently with another group called, called Doppel Paymer. And so we'll see how they work differently uh, together with this group. So QuakeBot, maybe you recall this um, malware. So it started initially as a kind of a banking Trojan, but it has kind of evolved during 2020. A uh, banking Trojan typically goes after an individual systems where at a certain moment they try to obtain your um, banking logon details, right? So QuakeBot also has opened up for the operators behind QuakeBot, the malware itself, and they've started working together with another group. In this case, double payment, right? So in your environment, you may have a system that has been affected by a phishing email and eventually QuakeBot is uh, installed on one of the systems within your, your network. That is traditionally where it would stop for QuakeBot, right? So they're targeting that specific system because they hope to find uh, banking details on that system. But also they are moving more to an APT style um, operation where they don't stop on that system. They also try to move laterally and they again try to obtain credentials. And we'll see also they have some ability to obtain data that is sensitive to your business. But then at a certain moment, they may hand off to another group, which is called double paymer. And they then focus on deploying them all, uh, the ransomware into your environment and ensuring that there's payout. And obviously there, there is likely an exchange of money between the two groups that is, that is happening. So speaking about that initial compromise, again, um, this can be in all varieties. In this case, it's a um, very traditional um, looking like um, the email phishing campaign where you receive an email with a hyperlink. Um, they don't attach the malware to the email itself, but they're rather hosted on a, a web server. And that web server hosts a zip file. If you download the zip file, if you open it up, that will contain a Visual Basic script, which will then download the actual malware and executes that onto your uh, onto your system itself. And that's again that initial foothold. Once they have access to that system, they go through all the different phases which I've uh, spoken about earlier, and then they can either obtain data from your system, deploy other modules like Cobalt Strike. Um, and various different um, techniques. And again, with the same idea, eventually um, they will hand off to this other group, Double Paymer, where they then will deploy ransomware on a much larger group of systems than the initial uh, system they've gotten access to. The big difference between Reevil and then Double Paymer is that they work much more. Um, yeah, I would say disruptive, right? In both cases, they encrypt data. The double paymer also deploys the ransomware 
and also makes your systems unbootable. And they make sure that once your systems are affected, that you're no longer, once they get restarted, uh, that you're no longer able to continue starting your system uh, and that you're always confronted with this uh, ransomware message. Again, the same techniques are being used. They use group policies to deploy this ransomware, place it on a syspol directory in the domain using um, comments like PASEXEC to deploy that or um, background intelligence service jobs or scheduled tasks to make sure that every system in the domain executes these, uh, these comments. And then eventually we'll load up the, uh, the ransomware encryptor on their system. Yeah, and again, we've seen QuakeBot being around for quite a while, as we've mentioned, starting as a banking trojan, but because they've likely become less successful, they're working in a partnership with other groups that then focus on the encryption of your data and also focus on the payout. So these are two different groups, two different kind of partnership model. Ransomware as a service where there's a ringleader that basically controls all of the affiliates and they have to um, they have to buy into that uh, model and have to share uh, part of the ransom. Whereas uh, QuakeBot and Double Paymer are working more side to side uh, of each other and one is handing off once they've gained the initial access to the other group who focuses them on the actual uh, payout. Now the, the pressing slide. <laughs> I, there are many things that you can do in security, but um, I honestly don't think that the problem is going to go away rapidly, right? So we certainly saw during 2020 things getting worse. Um, and this was a year where we were all affected by things like COVID um, and uh, a global pandemic where you see ransomware operators targeting, for example, healthcare, right? The organizations that we need most. Um, payouts, and I'll show that on the next slides, are increasing number of victims. There are very little repercussions for these ransomware uh, operators until there is, for example, a law enforcement going to knock on their door. And um, again, they're not using only by um, encrypting the data, they're also going to perform extortion. And they're using these more hand in hand to make sure they um, have a higher chance of, uh, of payout. And that, that's also what we see with, with many of the organizations that we are in discussion with. It, it has become from, from an IT problem to a really a boardroom level risk that has been discussed. And in many organizations, spoken also recently to um, an organization where they really said, okay, look, ransomware has now become one of the, one of the highest uh, risks that we're looking at as, a, as an organization, just because they're so effective. And it's also not something like, hey, just make sure that you have the right antivirus. It is something that they work very much like an APT actor. And if they've chosen you as a victim organization, they will, they will persist in making sure that you are at a certain moment uh, becoming a victim and they're able to encrypt that data. And this is just a slide, I think also worth mentioning, a, a partner of us, uh, Coveware, it's an organization that also deals with the kind of negotiations that companies have to, uh, they, they kind of uh, help you in that negotiations with those uh, vendors. And they also have a nice um, quarterly report where they report on the, um, on the payments, right? And you definitely see in 2020, the average and median um, ransomware payment uh, going up. There was a slight, there was a slight dip at, at the end of the year, but definitely in 2020, where seems like we're uh, again at the same kind of uh, kind of levels. And, and these are just averages and medians, right? Um, there are some cases where this is going into the millions. How do they determine the the level of the payout? That really depends on on how much uh, profit they can make, right? They have to, of course understand very well the psychologics of this organization. They can try to find out the, um, uh, the financial figures of this organization and then look at something that they think is a reasonable demand for the size um, of the organization that they target. 
So definitely when the ransomware or when the ransom where the encryptor is in the environment active, it will be very noisy. And, and definitely uh, that is something that you may discover. Uh, I've recently worked on some of the cases and they sometimes work until the evening and then make sure that they only detonate after midnight, as an example, just to make sure that the IT staff wouldn't be available at that time uh, to disrupt whatever they're doing. But this is something we predict them getting more and more stealthier, right? In the beginning, also with, with Chinese Nexus threat actors, they were quite noisy, but also last couple of years, they kind of retooled and re-engineered the processes and they're much more uh, stealthy into the environment. So that's something that we can predict may also happen with uh, ransomware operators. And they're pretty fast. Uh, some of the cases that I've worked on, on there were from initial intrusion to domain administrator in four or five days. And you really saw them working day and night to make sure that they get access to that environment as fast as possible. So it's also a race and it's a question of, are you able to, to defend yourself against something like that? And again, backups are for them um, a reason why you would not um, have a uh, payout because again, you're able to recover and so def definitely they have a big focus on making sure that you're not able to recover, so which increases their chances of a, of a payout. This is the part where I'm most pessimistic. Will this problem be solved? Unfortunately not. I think there um, we can try to up our game. We can try to um, make the best offenses as possible, but also like APT uh, actors, it's it's they're continuously innovating. Um, and unfortunately, that's their business model. Um, and again, we see ransomware attackers, it's not just a single guy, it's ringleaders, it's uh, affiliates, it's partnerships models that uh, are emerging between these different actors. So they will get better and better over time. So the way that how to protect against something like that is very much how you would protect against any other style of APT uh, intruders. And so one of the things that I really recommend, in case you haven't seen it, we've released a, uh, a white paper with some protection techniques. These are not high level uh, things to do, things to focus on, but very practical steps that you can take in your environment of how to harden, for example, your domain controller or how to harden your service accounts or um, things to monitor um, in your environment. And so very practical steps that we detail and um, that we find useful when we are doing these investigations. Again, there's a thousand things that you can do, but at least make sure that you cover these basics. Um, all the other steps, all the other things that you do against APT style actors, again, are also applicable to ransomware operators. Um, but try to also think about tabletop exercises. Uh, tabletop exercises are exercises where together with various stakeholders in your environment, you try to emulate a ransomware type attack uh, and try to understand, okay, how would each part of the business uh, function? And would you in fact um, start a negotiation with the ransomware operator? Would you consider a payout? I'd rather have those discussions with your board now than at the time when you're under pressure. And obviously, make sure that you're in a position to recover, that you are in a position to restore, and that you will, of course, um, put you in a position that you can negotiate uh, when something like this happens. Okay. So this was what I wanted to share. We've spoken about ransomware as a service, uh, very targeted uh, attacks. We've seen two different type of uh, ransomware uh, models, ransomware as a service, and where there's more partnership between some of these groups. And at, at the end, we've concluded with some of the things that you can do um, to uh, avoid being a victim in the, in the future. And if you are a victim, uh, how you can make yourself more resilient uh, against something like this. We have a few minutes before the end of the, um, of the session itself. Just wanted to see if there's any questions about what I've told or questions from the audience you can either put them in the chat or um 
Yeah, we got a few questions, Bart. Um, the first question is, uh, and we saw they target um, as well private as public enterprises, but do they also target the military? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, well, certainly I would say government at large is, is something that they do target. And for example, in the United States, um, they, do, they do target um, local communes, um, but military in particular, that is not something that I have seen uh, taking place. Now, whether that's because military environments have a higher level of security or yeah of course i also have to say that in the um our visibility as as, as management is of course also limited to to, to the to the to the customers that we that we do manage so we do have a bit of a bias on the um on the uh, victimology uh, so to say um but in terms of of the attackers themselves the uh, ransomware operators themselves it's, there is almost no boundary on, on, on who they target at. Uh, so defense sector definitely doesn't stand out as, as one of the particular victims, uh, as one of the environments, uh, but I definitely would not rule it out neither. All right, that's clear. Um, and another question is, and, and if I recall correctly, it was a slide about um, how they operate. And, and one of the terms you use was they do crypto properly. Um, it was one of the beginning of the slides. Um, uh, um, yeah, it was one of the of the first slides I I think about one of the. Uh, I'm not sure it was that one, but it was um, that they do crypto properly. I I think you mean that they're it's. it's uh, with a certain key, you, you cannot decrypt yourself, that you need to have the decryption key because there's no, um, yeah, to date, no issues found in crypto, that one. Um, but yeah, Yes, there was, there used to be a website uh, called uh, No More Ransomware, if you recall this. And uh, that is basically the point that I want to make, right? So the reasons why these websites and services were successful, because the kind of spray and pray uh, crypto, uh, they spread around and they target as many victims as, uh, as, as possible, but also with the same kind of uh, malware, um, the same kind of uh, encryption. And so also, if they've make making a they've made a, um, an error in the encryption mechanism, there was a possibility to decrypt it without having access to that key, or it was decrypted once, um, and therefore the the key can be reused against many other uh, victims um, to restore that data. That is not the case with the kind of actors that I'm uh, that I'm talking about. All right, so no hope for no more ransom with these guys. Well, I would say that no more ransom definitely is still, still successful against some of them, but not against these kind of uh, um, um, operators. All right, another question was, um, how can you hunt for those scripts to actually try to stop your, your active antivirus? Is there a way you can, you can yeah, pinpoint this type of scripts? Um, well, when we speak about detection, you don't have, only have to look at one particular point in time. I think that's the reason also why we use this attack life cycle, not only to document what is happening at each different phase, but also what you can do at each of these different phases, right? So speaking about the actual ransomware deployment um, that is happening, uh, of course, that is one of the later phases when they actually start deactivating the antivirus on the system and again they you can use powershell they can use any other scripts but in most cases this this may look very similar to any other system administration activity that you have going on so i agree with you it, it is something that may be difficult to spot but each of these different phases you have different opportunities to catch them um, in the act 
definitely at the moment that they come in, you may have spotted the phishing email um, or that URL that has been accessed or you have patched your uh, VPN systems or you saw the attempts against some of those systems. Also, when they establish foothold, they will use backdoors, right? So also these may be an indication that something is going on. Can Mimikets or process dumping um, to allow Mimikets to run? Again, all of these different phases are precursors to the eventual deployment. And I agree, not all of them are easy. There's MITRE tech framework that's going to help you identify which techniques are available to each of these uh, groups. Um, but these are also opportunities where you can protect against them and make it harder or detect it when it's actually taking place. I know that's not exactly the answer that you were looking for. You were probably hoping like, well, actually, this is the way that you can detect it. But that also looks like very regular uh, administrative um, activity. And again, if okay, you're less, using antivirus, so um, if you're using antivirus, monitor if your antivirus is running on all of your systems. I think that's uh, that's also um, that's a given. So, okay, the last question I got here, and uh, I think I can already agree with him, is that if he understands correctly, is the best way to protect ourselves is to improve our defense against uh, advanced uh, threats in general, because the ransomware is just a tool in the end. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah, indeed. Um, they are quite noisy, but they're noisy at the end. Before that time, they're stealthy, and they want to remain undetected until the time that they can detonate. And that's absolutely true. I think there's quite a lot of overlap between the groups. Also, what I've mentioned with like data theft, uh, use of uh, cloud services. We've also seen some APT actors using the same thing, right? You see a connection to Dropbox. It's not a legitimate user, but it's actually a APT actor that is hosting something on Dropbox and they share it with themselves. So anything that gets, um, um, that anything that gets written to your desktop is also being synchronized to him in the, in the cloud. And that is also what the ransomware operators use in some cases. So yes, definitely there's a lot of overlap with, between them, certainly with more of the advanced uh, groups. And of course, I'm not speaking about the spray and pray kind of ransomware. I think we, we may see a little drop off and focusing more on these um, um, more advanced ransomware operators. All right, that's clear. Um, okay, another question. Uh, people are on the roll now. Uh, what usually happens is the victim company proceed to pay out as requested by the attackers. Well, um, I'll, I'll, so I'll be clear. <laughs> we as Mandiant, we help organizations um, prepare for something like this, and we also investigate, and that's the work that I do. Uh, the kind of actual negotiations, uh, that's something that we don't help companies work with. And I, th I think we used to say in the past, like don't pay, um, but this is ultimately a, um, a business decision to make, right? So this is something that an organization needs to decide what are the le legal repercussions of actually paying to criminals and what is the impact to my business. And there are companies out there that help you in these kind of negotiations. And they also give you uh, advice whether you're working with a reliable partner. I'm not sure if I can use that word because obviously we're talking about criminals, but, but what is what are the chances that you're paying a large amount of money to a ransomware operator and he's not going to give you the key back? And it's maybe just going to ask for more money. So, um, or he's going to give you the key back but still have access to your environment so we can do that all over again. So there are companies out there that help you um, in that uh, difficult moment in time. And Coveware is just one of the organizations that we that we work with. Um, so yeah, that definitely depends on, on the group um, of uh, actors. Um, and um, yeah, of course, they also want to be reputable, right? Uh, if they would not hold their promises, they might not be successful for a long time. 
but in the end, they are criminals, so you can kind of expect anything. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I think that sums it up. They are criminals, so um, do not trust criminals. Uh, thank you very much, Vaj, for this uh, for this session. It was very interesting. Um, if anyone have any other questions, okay. Uh, which APT uses ransomware? So that's the last one. Um, right, right, right. Um, perhaps that, that is a question because uh, when people speak about APT, they also probably refer to kind of espionage groups, right? Um, so, so that is yeah, something like APT thirty four, for example. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. That that is that. I think that is a good point. <laughs> Because indeed, most APT actors are there for, for espionage, right? And so they don't conduct uh, destructive attacks, right? Because they, if they, of course, they do destruction um, and they encrypt all of your systems, you obviously would um, realize that they're into your environment. But there are a few exceptions to those that actually use and take down systems for that um, matter. And uh, one of the uh, most known groups is. Uh, are the Shumun operators. And they obviously are into networks and, and obviously uh, victims in the Middle East, um, such as uh, Saudi Aramco uh, is one of the examples uh, that is always being referred to where they um, operate like a ransomware uh, operator, but actually they want to cause disruption and they don't want to get that payout. I think for me, ransomware operators are people that eventually want to get money. That was definitely different with Shamoon. They wanted to appear like a uh, like a ransomware operator, but eventually they wanted to cause destruction. All right, great, thank you. Um, so, okay, um, and that's the real last question because we're we're uh, out of time actually. The DPRK actors also is a question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that's the other one that I wanted to mention, <laughs> because I mentioned uh, Iran, obviously, um, with the, the Shemun attacks. Uh, but indeed, yeah, the DPRK, that's another APT style uh, actor that may also behave like a ransomware uh, operator. Um, and indeed, there are some groups that there are just kind of crossover, right? So these are obviously nation states. Um, I mean, these guys on the picture, they're not nation state, right? <laughs> They're not hiding in their military compound or anything like that. They're just open on the internet and are showing up with their with their money. Um, but no, indeed, there, there are some um, groups from from Iran um, that have a, um, a lower um, or I would say higher tolerance of causing uh, in, unintended consequences. And bringing down this, uh, systems is one of them. And again, DPRK is another example. Of, um, and there are some uh, groups there that are also conducting uh, destructive attacks. And some of the Chinese Nexus uh, groups also kind of are more on the crossover between criminal activity and sometimes helping out their government. So that, that really depends. But it needs, it's definitely not exclusively only to uh, Iran, for, as an example. All right, great. Um... By the way, thank you for all the questions. Um, it's really uh, insightful. Um, I think we can wrap up. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you will get a confirmation about the recording also uh, in your inbox. So, uh, but thank you very much for this session. I think it was an eye opener for a lot of people. And, and I can recommend everyone to really um, check out the report because there are a few quick wins in it to really uh, increase the security for your organizations. So, um, all right, but thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. Goodbye. Have a nice day.